Roger, we're looking at the data. Stand by one van. Correct. Attack in, so tactically to aid the navigation. As we told you about an hour ago, uh, weather is ideal at the Cape for the landing. Feet per second. There was some ground fog that there was concern about. However, Chief Astronaut John Young, who's been up in a modified Gulfstream jet, and uh, two other T-38s have been up taking a look at the weather. Everything was given a go a little over an hour ago, and we're in the process of landing the space shuttle now. Velocity Mach 5.9. The shuttle will hit the west coast of Florida at about, what did they say, 90,000 feet or so? 90,000 feet, to uh, five times the speed of sound. And that's roughly the ground track. Uh, I think we're about uh, 100 miles off the west coast of Florida now. And it will take a sweeping left turn over the Atlantic. Challenger, Houston, transfer state vector to back up your convenience then on into okay, we'll the Kennedy Space Center, which has been ready for landing a shuttle ever since the shuttle program began. Isn't that not right? Yeah, they've uh, been anxious. They've got a beautiful runway there, over three miles long, uh, 300 feet wide. And uh, the program is very interested in, in uh, getting the landings uh, into Kennedy because it saves line. about uh, five days That's of turnaround select. time at least, not having Just, to cart uh, the uh, Challenger the, uh, back from line. Edwards. Crossing the coast. Uh, Live pictures Roughly now. To Newport, I shot into the uh, altitude, 110,000 feet, velocity Mach 4.3. Challenger Houston Energy ground track and nav are go. Uh, excellent, John. Thank you. Vehicle in the automatic flight mode still. We're about eight minutes out. A Mach 4 velocity. There she is. Drops like a rock. 3,000 feet. Yeah, it flies about like a brick with wings. And uh, the. Uh Jim Bajan, we've been hearing about some braking problems with the shuttle. Does that concern you at all on this runway? Uh, it really shouldn't. The uh, brakes have uh, worked in the past. There's some concern about if you cycle the brakes that you may have difficulty. And that role reversal, uh, very clearly video, uh, visible on uh, NASA Select. But the braking schedule Inertial is going to be used on this velocity, mission. Uh, 3.1 mark. And this, of course, will be the first time the people in Florida will get the to hear the double sonic boom. Take air data. Roger, take air data. That's We're told we will not actually see the shuttle until it is almost directly overhead, about, uh, oh, about five minutes from now. Altitude 87,000 feet, uh, sink rate of uh, 270 feet per second. L Lynn, all the way down, the, the crew has reported that the Challenger is, uh, is performing perfect. Their, their deorbit burn uh, was right on schedule. Uh, they apparently uh, have no problems at all with their auxiliary power units. If uh, some the folks out there might remember, we had a small fire after landing. I think that problem is solved also, uh, landing on the last Challenge mission. Now just, uh, it apparently, it, it apparently was solved, the, uh, along with the uh, uh, general purpose computer that failed, um, which was found to be slivers of solder, believe it or not. In, uh, a $15,000 unit or some such thing, uh, some enormous cost. There we see it now. 46 miles, altitude 74,000 feet. That's a beautiful picture from a long-range Air Force uh, and NASA great, camera. Still losing altitude 40, at the rate of about 200 feet per second. 46 miles would put it approximately over Orlando, and uh, just be a couple more minutes, you'll be crossing the east coast of Florida, making that left turn to come back to the southeast uh, and landing on runway 15. Lynn, you should be seeing it at any minute now. Not yet, Jules, not yet. Uh, I said at any minute. Uh, provided by the uh, long-range uh, tracker at uh, Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. I expect, Lynn, you'll also have a very uh, predominant, uh, predominant double uh, 
chronic burn there this morning because of the clear weather. Well, I think you're right. Everybody's been told to expect that. Miles, so, uh, well, let's see. I see fingers pointing up into the sky, but so far, no sighting from our position. Still over 50,000 feet high, so uh, it's now becoming a uh, familiar area. Well, We've got it. We've got it, it here. Altitude. In any second now, Van should be taking over manual control. Twenty-nine miles. Slide on in from there. That's a well, that's a fabulous sight. Feet. That's a fabulous sight for the people at the Kennedy Space Center. This is the this is really the moment they've been waiting for to get it back here, so they can service it quickly, turn it around, and get it back up again as quickly as they can. It's got to be a great reward for all the people who uh, who who are on a launch team to see it come back like this. I would imagine it's a pretty nice view for the guys up there too to look down and see uh, the launch pad. You know, it was coincidental. Vance uh, flew the path from Houston to Florida with the shuttle about the same uh, as he does with the T-38 on a weekly basis, except he was a little higher and faster. And the shuttle's yeah. coming back to Florida, Lynn, uh, speeds up the shuttle program because it lessens turnaround time, as NASA calls it. And Vance is taking manual control right now, turning around the hack for the final turn into the field. Okay, the hack then, heading alignment circle, so they get a big sweeping turn. Let it start. You can see how the bottom of the uh, of the shuttle is somewhat um, darkened, of course, and that's from the heat of reentry again. The tiles are. And right now, Challenger is heading uh, oh, just about out over the ocean, and it's sweeping into that big circle right over the shuttle landing facility here. There's a T-38, obviously, up there with it, taking those pictures. And then you couldn't have painted the sky a pretty. There we go. We just boom. got the double sonic boom. Some squeals of delight here in Florida. There's a shot Altitude, from the chase team. Uh, 30,000 feet, range uh, 16 miles to the end of the runway, uh, sink rate uh, about to 250 feet per second. Coming down at a very high rate uh, the, uh, because of... landing gear valves are open. APU performance uh, still nominal. All uh, APUs running at uh, roughly 106 percent. Uh, That's or 106, uh, several thousand feet per second. About 12 to 15 thousand feet a minute is how they're flying. The only person I know at this table who descended at that rate was Gene Stern aboard Apollo 17. It was way back from the moon. That, that's history. This is the future we're looking at now. No, this is the present and the future. Now less than 200 feet per second. What a beautiful sight. This is like a painting. Flight control in the automatic mode. Bringing with it, of course, those two jet backpacks, which made such history. Boy, Van Scram has a lot of things under his belt now, doesn't he? Uh, airspeed uh, 256 knots, altitude 17,000 feet. 17,000 feet. He's on his final, uh, final approach into the landing. So you ought to have a beautiful sight from there. 21.5 Gs on the heading alignment cone. It's just it's a slowing. little bit of fog rolling on the runway now, but it is quite clear. There is not a cloud, as you can see. And he's slowing down using ailerons and spoilers, just like any commercial airliner would. Van should be lined up about this point on final approach, about 22 degree uh, glide angle. 12,000 feet. Seven miles from the uh, runway. Look good rolling out on final calm surface wind. Airspeed. This landing is really the final operational test of this vehicle, a landing in Florida. Challenge now visible at uh, Cape After uh, this, it will truly be an operational space spacecraft. Uh, 6,000 feet altitude, uh, four miles range, uh, sink rate uh, 170 feet per second. And and it's uh, under a minute until touchdown. Then it never fails to impress, even sitting here watching it on television. It's a, it's a, a very, very predominant, impressive uh, feeling you get watching uh, the Challenger come back home, especially after seeing those uh, spacewalks. Uh, uh, it, it's the same vehicle, remember. And this, Gene, this is very much like the landing of this first uh, uh, Columbia in California, because it is new. It's never been done here before. He is really coming in smoothly now. The landing gear will be the next major uh, event here. To, there it is. There's a gear. Not bad and, uh, timing. Oh, is that beautiful? Looks like it's he's got the good. runway made. He's Look right on top wings. of it, right down the center line. That's a thousand foot marker. He's landed about nice three thousand. Touchdown. Down 
perfect. Touchdown. Six seconds Literally ahead of time, one. according to the clock. Space shuttle's first floor to land. A lot of happy people back there. You can see the humidity come off the wings as he's uh, rolling out. That's uh, water. It's still deep. foggy here, Gene, a little bit. Very humid. Looks like he's going to have Right in step. front of us. momentarily, around 150 knots or so. Bring to a fairly rapid halt on the runway. He really makes it, look easy. makes it look just like a landing at any old airport. And there goes the convoy right after uh, Challenger. 140 people going out with their special equipment to make sure the vehicle is safe, to get rid of any possible toxic fumes, poisonous gases that may be in the vicinity. That's good news. Steady braking. That's what they were a little concerned about. Like the swallows coming back to Capistrano, this really completes the circle. <laughs> you realize, uh, obviously you realize, Gene, they are only about uh, three miles, four miles from the launch pad. That is some record. Eight days in space, right back where they started from. And that ends all the fears and apprehensions, then, about whether that 15,000-foot runway, surrounded by swamp, whether that could, whether you could get the shuttle down. Well, this really put to rest all the fears, right, Jules, that anybody had about whether they could make it here or not. Okay, that was so nice. I think we're going to look at it again. We always like to look at landings and launches more than one time on the day they happen. Here we go. Final approach. This is a replay. And when the Challenger landed, ground control said, welcome home, fantastic job. They weren't kidding. Lynn, that picture is just, it's its almost like someone's imagination that's so pretty. Challenger Look at that angle down. And momentarily, Vance Brand will flatten it out and drop the gear. He doesn't really do a flare, as we call it, in the small planes or fighters. He steadily brings the nose up, having bled off most of the speed, then drops the gear at four or 500 feet altitude. Lynn, it's obvious now, uh, I think all the folks viewing can see how swampy the area is around uh, the Kennedy Energy Space Center there. Uh, still down, uh, and that big tree flare right there where he starts bleeding off the last bit of airspeed. And as Jules said, right around three, 400 feet, the uh, pilot, Bob Gibson, We'll put the wheels down. There it goes Hooter right there. Calling. Hooter. Yeah, Hoot as he's known around the office. And uh, Vance slowed down around 190 knots in that vicinity for a final touchdown. Matt. Touchdown. Well, Challenger is home. Challenger is in Florida. Challenger at the moment is at the end of the runway waiting to be serviced, and the astronauts will be coming out, oh, in about 45 minutes or so from now. Uh, we will probably show you lots more pictures and tell you more about it when our coverage of the Space Shuttle Challenger continues in a moment. To get ahead in business, it's for only $5. When you send your check today, determined that that wasn't a factor. Typical Florida morning. There you saw 7,000 feet to go. Vance Brand at the controls. crew is the access vehicle carrying stairs similar to those used for, for aircraft. This one has a uh, small white room at the top to maintain clean conditions. So post-landing activities at the shuttle Challenger will now take place. The astronauts will be out of the orbiter in about 45 minutes or so. We're going to take a break. We'll continue live coverage of the landing of Mission 41 Bravo after a short break. An early successful mission, a bittersweet mission, if you will. There were some problems, but first there were the successes. A terrific launch, 
uh, last Friday, uh, no weather problems, no mechanical problems. It was what they called, I think, the smoothest ever. And then, of course, there was that absolutely fantastic space walk, the first of two. Uh, that one took place on Tuesday morning, and that was the day that Bruce McCandless and Bob Stewart tried out for the first time their jet backpacks. Right now, you're seeing, I believe that is Bruce McCandless. On top of his helmet was a camera. On his back was a 300-pound jet backpack. Uh, they've been working on this for more than 15 years, and it works perfectly. Let's listen to Bruce McCandless. Here's when you put in a uh, prolonged translation, the thing shudders and rattles and shakes. Just for the record, I don't see any stars out here. And, uh, Bob, we're not going to pay much attention to you for a little while here while we watch Bruce go out and back. And, uh, here's a different perspective on the orbiter. Okay, Bruce, we have a good shot of the payload bay. Hey, this is Steve. Candlest at a distance of about 80 feet. The uh, TV ranger yet? Uh, not yet. He'll be going about twice that far out on this exercise. Yeah. All right. Candless and his manned maneuvering unit uh, constitute a separate spacecraft of their own now. Well, you may get the uh, name of the world's fastest human being uh, going along there at four miles a second, Bruce. The record will only stand, I guess, for the next hour or so. Well, those two spacewalkers are back to Earth now. Uh, their vehicle is Challenger. They're sitting at the end of the runway, and at the moment, the astronauts are inside throwing switches, uh, cutting off power supplies, things like that, and there is a convoy outside of the vehicle, which is trying to make it all safe to be sure everything is okay, and the astronauts will be sitting in their orbiter for about another 45 minutes or so. The idea is be sure everything is okay, and they should get their land legs back. Uh, if you'll recall the last time Challenger landed when the guys came down the, the uh, stairs afterwards, they looked a little bit shaky. I think they want to give them a chance to get back to Earth for real. Well, a successful landing, a successful launch, a gorgeous spacewalk or two, but there were some mishaps on this mission, uh, some problems, some things that went wrong that were not entirely in NASA's control. Let's take a look at some of them to remember this mission. The first problem was the Westar satellite, the one that was deployed for Western Union. It got out of the orbiter okay, but it turns out that its upper stage motor probably misfired. And Westar, which was supposed to go to 22,000 miles, only landed much shorter of that. It's, it's just useless, unfortunately, cannot be used at all. The second problem, a balloon, a two-yard in diameter balloon that they deployed in order to practice some rendezvous techniques. Well, the balloon just burst. Uh, that one is on uh, NASA's ledger because uh, that was their balloon that they had bought. Third problem was the second satellite. It, too, misfired, deployed beautifully from Challenger. All the telemetry indicated that the astronauts did everything right, but somehow that upper stage motor seems not to have fired right. It is also in what is called a useless orbit. Uh, they have contact with both the this satellite, which is for the government of Indonesia, and that Western Union satellite but they're no good. So those were the two big disappointments of this mission. But now that we uh, see Challenger on the runway, certainly that and the spacewalk seem to compensate for quite a lot of that. Gene, uh, you have seen Challenger. Jules, you've seen Challenger sitting on